Good afternoon. I'm David Uy with the Chinese American Museum DC, the first and only museum in our nation's capital dedicated to the Chinese American story. So welcome to Mooncakes and Tea, our celebration of the Mid-Autumn Moon Festival. We are excited today because this is one of our first hybrid events where we have people joining us in person and online. And uh, this is the first time we were doing both at the same time. So this is in a webinar format. So our online guests will not be seen or heard, but you can at home ask questions through the chat or Q and A feature. So today we welcome our two distinguished guests uh, who will tell us about this traditional holiday, the food and drink and the traditions of the day and uh, you know what it, what it all entails. Uh, Victoria Wu from Cakes by Happy Eater, located in Manassas, Virginia, and Yunhan Zhang, who is from Valley Brook Tea, just around the corner at DuPont Circle 21st and T. So, so Victoria, why don't we start with you? And tell us a little bit about um, uh, Cakes by Happy Eatery. Sure. Thank you, David, for inviting us to this cultural experience. You know, um, I'm Victoria Wu, and I operate my family's second generation business, the bakery. And when my immigrant parents came to the United States, they had taken over an in-laws bean sprout business, and they grew it to become an Asian supplier to the local restaurants. And then when they had extra time, they decided to go into the hospitality business. And the name was originally known as Happy Eatery. And my mom and my aunt were the ones that named the bakery, Happy for Joy and Eatery for the trend of the 1980s. And along the way, I wanted to change the name, but it's like a name that you were born with and people identified it and the reputation was there. Eventually I did modify the name to Cakes by Happy Eatery to reflect what we do best. And that is Cakes. So number one, it's really, um, I joined my family business full time in about the early 2000s. And I left my field of banking and finance to come to the bakery side for two reasons. One, I wanted my parents to travel. I had a sister that lived overseas and business owners in the bakery business do not go on vacation in November and December. <laughs> so I wanted to go on vacation. And then number two, the rise of the food network made creative cakes more in demand. And I knew what SpongeBob looked like, but that did, was not in my current state of vocabulary. <laughs> and I'm joined at the bakery um, by my sis, with my sister Emily, who is really the wizard behind us. Our creative forces, she makes it into reality. And we are very pleased to continue the tradition of the mooncakes. Um, I think my father will be extremely pleased um, that this, this generation knows how to make mooncakes and not break his precious name. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Yunan, what's, uh, what's new at uh, Valley Brook Tea? What's, what's going on? Uh, thank you, David. Uh, happy to be here again. I think this is my third time or the fourth time uh, to be with the museum. <laughs> so a little bit history about Valley Brook Tea. So this is my family business. And we are still a tea producer uh, based in Fujian, that's in uh, Southeast China. So we're very lucky to have a very in a vertically integrated business. Uh, we, own the, we own the land, tea mountains, tea plants, processing facility, uh, tea ware, manufacturing. So basically everything you see here uh, is our product. Uh, all the things down to the you know, little packages. So we first opened our uh, DC store, uh, which is the first US store, one month before the pandemic. So very good timing, very good timing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just very happy we still have a business here in DC. Uh, before that, I was in finance as well. So, okay. and now I also know, you know, store owners have no holiday because no. we have been working 12 hours a day, every day since uh, last February. So, uh, yeah, so the purpose of our business here is really just trying to bring something very authentic. store. Uh, if you go to our store, you will realize that's kind of like fast serving style business. 
But if you really want to, you can also have the TSET keywords. So that's how we want to bring people into the world of tea by just uh, you know open, opening up a small window or door for people to see what this is all about. So thank you very much for, for having yeah. me here. Yeah. We, um, we both are starting operations in the middle of a pandemic. So we have that, we share that in common. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, there, there are people that came from China. There are people that are ABCs like me, uh, uh, Hapa even, uh, you know, there, I think there are different perspectives and understandings of what a uh, mid-autumn moon festival even is. So maybe we could talk a little bit about what, we all know about uh, the festival and you know how it's been an important part of your life or or not or um, very important in my family my parents really instilled family and that starts very early on and it is also teaching the tradition so while we may not have known the full extent of it mid-autumn festival is similar to thanksgiving is giving thanks to the harvest. It's about family, it's about gathering and having a great meal. So there were certain, I remember, iconic dessert, of course, is always mooncake. You can't talk about mid-autumn festival without mooncakes. But after that is these big celebrations. And again, I'm appreciative to my family, to my parents, that always was very much on the Asian holidays and then even my aunt and uncle for the American holidays. And I was mentioning someone, I have layers and layers of in-laws but we don't treat each other like in-laws or family. Uh, you know, to me, because I, I am Chinese from China, so to us, uh, Mid Autumn Festival has always been the second most important <coughs> holiday after Chinese Spring Festival. Uh, now I think when I was a kid, Mid Autumn Festival wasn't a holiday, so you, you don't really get a day off. You you still go to school. I think now. It's more, even more important because it is now officially holiday. You get one day off uh, combined with a weekend. So you can make a small, you know, long weekend holiday. So I think young people now appreciate this holiday even more. And I'm from a city called Xiamen. So in where we're from, we have a special thing called Bo Bing. It's a dice game. Uh, it's hard to describe. So basically it's, it's like a small gambling thing, but it's, you don't really gamble with money. Uh, we, we use that event to give out a uh, prize, such as Zhuang uh, Yuan, which is like the, the, the number one, can get the largest Yuan Bing, the moon okay. cake. So it comes with, traditionally it comes with different sizes. The lowest one is about this big. So the biggest one can be about this big. Now in modern times that can, the big price can be a phone, can be a car, can be even a house. Depends on the level you want to play. Uh, but hey, that's what makes it more fun. So this is why I want to, to talk about it specifically. Seriously, I think next year we should try something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we were talking earlier uh, about how it's changed over time, right? The, I think the perspective on the holiday, it's become uh, maybe also a day off of work. Correct. Uh, yeah, so if you think about how this entire holiday started, uh, it's called mid autumn. Mid autumn doesn't necessarily mean September because we use a uh, lunar calendar. So mid autumn is actually in our own calendar is August 15th. So uh, with modern calendar here, the dates change every single year. But with the Chinese calendar, it's always August 15th. So historically, that's the time where all the harvests uh, are over. So if you think about farmers, that's the only time they have after a very busy season. So that's how they can celebrate. Uh, secondly, uh, as a Chinese, I think Chinese value the moon more than the sun. If you look at the poetry uh, or songs, uh, you will realize people talk about the moon even more. So August 15th is significant because that will be the uh, biggest and the roundest for the moon of the year on that day. So yeah, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's why mid autumn, that's how it, this name uh, will become mid autumn yeah, instead of something else. Uh, it started, uh, I think around Tom Dynasty, 
uh, we call the Chinatown Taranjie. That's basically all Chinese things started here. Uh, then you all, it goes all the way to Song, where tea gets involved even more. Uh, traditionally, tea has always been a part of important holidays is if you have to choose a very elegant beverage, tea is usually the choice. Uh, in Song Dynasty, there was that kind of tea called Tuan Cha, uh, which looks like a round uh, tea break, very different from the tea break we see today because that is more precious. Uh, in Song Dynasty, Tuan Cha, because of the name, then you got associated with Mid Autumn Festival because Mid Autumn Festival is about family reunion. In Chinese, that's called Tuan Yuan. So Tuan Yuan, Tuan Cha, it makes a lot more sense for these two things to com combine together to be enjoyed on that day. And since Tuan Cha back in days was very precious, we're talking about only the top of the top, like the royal court can have the, had the privilege to enjoy that. So if you have to spend time drinking something special on a very special day, what would you choose tea and which day would you choose the mid autumn festival so that is the uh, beginning of the importance of tea and mid autumn festival now is the portion of the event where we quiz you on your knowledge of the the legends and the folklore that led to the holiday so what do you, what do you know about the, the 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 story the legend the story where do we start? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> uh, so I'll throw something out there. Uh, so this year we made this uh, Mid Autumn Festival bag for our customers. Uh, so a lot of people, a lot of customers ask us why there is a rabbit. Uh, so from what I know, what I've been told since I was a kid is the dark part of the moon that looks like a rabbit. Essentially, that's why we associate rabbits with uh, the moon. Then since moon is what we celebrate on this special day, rabbits got associated with this holiday. So yeah, and I pass to uh, me. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there were many stories. I had even asked my family and everybody came up with different folklore. The one that I liked the best was there was a hunter and there were many moons up there. And he was very good and he shot down all the moon except for one, the most significant one. And as a gift, he was given um, a token, a pill for like immortality. And he kept it safe, but then somebody bad came into the home and his wife, to make sure um, that the bad person didn't get it, she took that pill and she got sent to the moon. And the rabbit, I think, was separate. I don't think she went up with the rabbit, but there was a separate one there. And so for immortality, her husband always looked up and saw the beautiful moon and saw his beautiful wife. And if you need more, go look at the Disney movie, China, that they had came out last year, and you can get more of a spot on that. <laughs> and I've heard a version of the story where there were multiple suns burn, burning the, up the earth, and they he got rid of all the suns but one. Maybe it was the sun and not the moon. And then the <laughs> moon was the reward as well. The yeah, the right. Well, the moon was the destination. The, the moon was the, the destination. Was the, for the, for the yeah. But he, it was done, a good deed came back to him, but then his wife was up there. Gotcha. <laughs> so, you know, I always feel like the I, uh, in my childhood, I, I only saw moon cakes around mid autumn yeah. moon festival. Um, but do you, is your bakery only producing them at this time of year, or do you also produce them during the? We do like moon cakes. It's like you know, as, as I said, this is very similar to Thanksgiving. So when you come up towards Thanksgiving, you have pies. When we come up to the Mid Autumn Festival, you have moon cakes, and we do make the moon cakes. We start three weeks um, prior over at Cakes by Happy Eatery, and we make our all of our moon cakes. Each one are individually rolled and made by hand every single day. So we see what our volume is. So it, it's a long process to make this. It takes patience, a lot of patience. Um, and so we actually make our moon cakes twice a year. We make it during the Mid-Autumn Festival 
And then for Chinese New Year's, we make the ones that are the prosperity fish because in the Chinese culture, everything is about symbolism. So fish is about prosperity. And we like to put the pineapple in our fish because pineapple represents hospitality. So for people to be prosperous and hospitable, that is a great trait to have. And that's why we do this. And then for Chinese New Year's, we'll do several different other um, fish shaped ones too. So walk us through uh, sure. you know, the, the components of the moon cake. So a lot of people say, what is a moon cake? It's basically, it, for those of us that knows it, but for those that don't, they're about the, don't, the size of a donut. And they have different fillings inside. So all throughout China and some of the other East Asian countries that are influenced by the Chinese tradition, they mostly have either a fruit filling in there, a nut filling in there, a seed filling in there. Some even have like ham, the pork inside there too. So since my father is from Guangzhou, we make the Cantonese style of mooncakes. So these are dense um, pastries in there. And then the way you enjoy it, and they have beautiful intricate patterns on top. And then the way we slice it, similar to pies, cut them into wedges, and then you'll have a small piece and then you pair them off with a wonderful cup of tea. Uh, someone has asked, can we, can they order moon cakes from you online? Not online, but what you can do is call the bakery and then for sure we can ship. We've done a lot of shipping this year. Okay, oh, last year. Oh, you can ship. We can ship. These things okay. we can ship. All right. Question answered. And uh, I guess same question to you, Yunhan. If people, people can order tea online. Right, or uh, your, our website, your website. Uh, and at the end of the uh, program, we will put those uh, websites up on the screen. And then everyone that's registered for the event will receive a follow-up email that has those kinds of links. Um, what would you say is the most popular um, filling? Is it the, yeah. the white lotus seed paste? We do traditional, and then we also do a little bit of the modern style of the moon cakes. The most traditional ones are definitely the, the red bean and then the lotus. Brown is the symbolism for togetherness and unity. That's why most of the moon cakes are round. You do have that are square, like the Vietnamese, like the square one. And square, the square means like the, um, the earth and then the ground is uh, the moon, excuse me, the yoke inside means like the sky. So we do have some of these that have the yoke inside. So the yoke represents the moon. And then the brown shape represents the completeness of unity. Then we also have one over at the bakery that we do is the lemon ginger. And that is a wonderful combination. And that is just really refreshing. So for people that like that one, and winter melon is good. And so the, some of these bases, we can go many. So we've had people also make special requests. So it's said, okay, next year we will consider and we will try doing some ube one. And personally, I really want my sister to make me a chocolate version of a food cake. So I'm putting it out there now. Someone the other day said, oh, I think the question was posed, what, what's your favorite? And someone said, cappuccino. <laughs> and I thought, well, there there's just about everything. There are different there are, ones. Yeah. But you know what? Now with many cross-cultural and our palates, it is still the traditional take of a moon cake, but it's just bringing it up to a little bit of a modern take on it. So, I don't know if the cappuccino one was in the from the Tang Dynasty, but well, well it's certainly everywhere in China now. I mean, there are videos you can find on YouTube mm -hmm. about how many different kinds of uh, uh, mooncakes are there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just talk about the traditional ones. Uh, Jenny and I we were talking about mooncakes, and she's from Shanghai, so they eat this fresh meat mooncake. Mm -hmm. It looks completely different too, like a show cow. I, it's hard to describe it. If you, if I don't tell you that's a mooncake, you just think it's a you know normal food. Yeah, that's how I see it. Uh, <laughs> mooncake so, tartar. Okay. Right, so, <laughs> and not raw. It's not cooked. It's like it's so smoked. It, it has like to be. Smoked. It has to be enjoyed fresh. So in Shanghai, at least, there will be lines. Okay. Like waiting to get fresh ones, like hot ones. Uh, very good. Very good. No, we when we when it cools out of the oven, it's definitely hot, and we have to wait for it to be completely cool right. before we package it. But you're right; it has a very different texture. It just melts in your mouth when mm -hmm. it's when it's like warm, like a nice warm temperature. 
So it is a treat to have fresh moon cakes. So that's the compliments that we get is that this tastes very different because it's fresh. So from beginning to end, how long does it take to, to make one? Oh, that's why we have an assembly line at the bakery. Yeah. That means one's cooking, one's rolling, uh, one's filling. It's a stop and go process because you cannot just simply, once it's finished, you can't just simply put it into the oven and call it a day in like 45 minutes or so. It has to come in and out of the oven in order for it to properly rest. And then you have to give it the nice suntan lotion and the suntan timing in the oven to get it that yes. perfect golden brown. So anybody who wants to work their arm muscle, come see us at the bakery in September, October. As I said, the Mid Autumn Festival is, is the eighth day. I mean, it's the 15th day of the eighth month, so like right. August 15th. And it does change every year based on the lunar calendar. So what's the most unusual special request that you've received for, for filling? It's still pretty standard in terms of flavor. We'll do also mooncakes. Um, we have also people having, say, Asian-themed weddings, or they're having, they want something that's traditional. And this is a beautiful presentation. So it's usually always the fish that they want because it gets prosperity to the new couple, prosperity to the family. And we can also do it in a peach flavor in here. Mm -hmm. So for a longevity, especially when you're having, you know, a, a major birthday celebration. So everything is made at the bakery. So you tell me what your wishes are and we can either make it happen or we have to adjust it a little bit. I cannot make a fish fly. So <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we uh, turn our attention to tea? And uh, I guess, first of all, you talk about how tea fits into the tradition of the holiday. Uh, uh, is it is it always a component? I mean, tea is such a component in Asian Pretty culture in general. <laughs> but uh, I think it's important for mooncakes for many reasons. The biggest reason would be the mooncakes, they are very sweet. Mm -hmm. So you need something like tea to, to go with it. Otherwise, it's a lot of sugar. No, it, it, you're right. It, you're, it's, it's, a really, it's a balance. Right. It's, uh, so. Honestly, I think most people drink tea these days with mooncakes because of that. But, you know, besides tea, if you are in China, what else can you drink? You are not going to go for the liquor all the time. So <laughs> then, then there is no meal can, can go on. Well, funny story, all the tea makers are, all the tea makers are heavy drinkers. Uh, that's very surprising to me uh, when I was a kid. Uh, I know this is off topic, but uh, tea um, is just a very good beverage, no matter what time of the day it is, no matter what the occasion is, you can't really go wrong with tea. Uh, so think about this, you have a full moon out there, you're enjoying some very nice bakery, then a cup of hot tea to go with it. It's just a very artistic lifestyle. And that kind of lifestyle is what we want as you know chinese that's educated that's uh, cultured so that's kind of like the lifestyle we go we go for and tea shares a major part of that lifestyle yeah so back to the no no i think i think we'll we'll go on our tea tour now oh sure <laughs> uh so again well i'm just gonna show how we do this research traditional tea wear then. Uh, so I think today we're gonna enjoy this. It's a oolong tea here. By the way- So all this, all this tea comes from your family's right. uh, uh, farms. farms. So this one comes from Wuyishan, that's in Northern Fujian province. By the way, if you are wondering what kind of tea you are drinking right now, it's this one. Uh, it's called Golden Peony. Uh, we have a little, little bit more here. Uh, so oolong is my favorite because oolong is the most complex tea. Uh, black tea here, for example, uh, you can see the package difference is uh, significantly smaller than a wulong tea. That's because black tea is harvested early, so leaves are much, much smaller. Uh, remember earlier I said something called Kuan Cha, that's the Song Dynasty, very expensive uh, tea cake or tea break. That thing is um, harvested a little bit like this type of black tea. 
So back in days in Song Dynasty alone, they hired about 5,000 people to work in the tea field just to make huan cha for the royal tribute. Uh, the harvest of fresh leaves is very specific. They need to use their nails to take the baby leaves out. They, you cannot use your fingers because they think the extra heat from your fingertip destroys the quality. So you snap it, then you take the take off the two bigger leaves, then two smaller leaves. You have the baby butts about this big. So think about how hard it will be to actually snap something, put it in your hand, keep doing this a couple hundred or thousand times per day. That's why it was super expensive. Now for this type of black tea is similar, we also use only the butt. That's why they're smaller. Oolong tea, however, is significantly larger because oolong is harvested in uh, late April or early May. So this is how big the leaves are. I don't know if you can really see it. Uh, let people online here see. So this is Kaiwa. Uh, we don't drink from this. You can see it as a teapot or tea making vessel. So what we want to do is put all the leaves in. And uh, hot water, boiling temperature water. Uh, don't ever let the water temperature to go down for oolong tea. Always use water at the boiling temperature. If it cools down, reheat it again. If you reheat it too many times, dump the entire bottle, then just add fresh water to it. Can it be too hot? Uh, well, since it's boiling temperature already, depends on the uh, altitude, right? So mm -hmm. using water at the uh, boiling temperature. So, oh, this is hard to use. Go like this, put the water in. Uh, I do this to wipe the bubbles out. Uh, oolong tea has some bubbles. Sorry, this is a little bit hard to control. Then with no wait time, just, just pour. So pour water in, then pour tea out. Uh, later on, if you want to smell the tea, you can come over here because the smell is actually an important part of it. Uh, cha with a sure sound way, which means the color, uh, the aroma, and the taste. That creates an experience. If some beverage you only have the taste, but no smell, it's not a good beverage. For example, nobody knows what a Coke, Coke looks like, smells like, right? You, you never know what a Coke smells like because it has only taste. It's not exactly a good beverage, but everybody knows a good wine or a good whiskey it smells great. So you can smell it before you drink it. That's how we know it's a good drink. Uh, <laughs> I'll show the color here. All right, so this vessel is called Cha Hai or Gong Dao Bei. Uh, depends on how you translate it. This can be called uh, the fair cup, which means everybody gets a fair amount of cup. It's a vessel we use to share. Uh, the history of this one begins uh, as a drinking vessel, like for liquor. So a couple of thousand years ago, for example, 2000 years ago, if you go to, some, if you go to somebody's banquet, how can you make sure you don't get poisoned, right? So, so many people will say, you'll bring your own cup. Now, the more elegant solution would be, everybody gets the same drink from the same vessel. If somebody wants to get you, they have to get everybody else. Uh, later on, this becomes an important part of the tea vessel as well. So we use this one to share. Then finally, we have uh, tea cups. Now, too many people here, this is an extremely small cup, right? The tea cups we use is usually like a mug bigger. Uh, the reason we use smaller ceramic cups for tea uh, is first, uh, China can make ceramic small. I mean, there is a reason why the country is called China because we make a lot of ceramic. To make something smaller, you just need to have a clay that's very strong, very dense. The second reason is when you pour hot tea into a smaller vessel like this, it cools down faster. So once you pour hot tea into it, you can just drink, you can sip from it. So no wait time. So here we are. That's the very basics of uh, traditional teaware, Gaiwan, uh, the pitcher and tea cups.
Now from there, we have a lot more accessories. For example, the first one, the, this bamboo tree, bamboo tree I use to show you dry leaves is called cha zi. This one has no other function but to show you the leaves. That's it. Uh, then from there, we have this. Uh, sometimes it's called wu jing zi, sometimes it's called si jing zi, like four gentlemen or five gentlemen. It's uh, just little tools, such as the, this to take something. You know, for example, take a leaf out of it. Then we also have the scoop to take tea leaves out of a tea jar. Then we even have these little tools to catch teacups to put some, you know, if somebody is sitting very, very far away. So now this just shows why tea as a culture is a little bit more Interesting. A lot of Chinese food is associated with a very common lifestyle. For example, we say chai mi you yan jiang su cha. What does it mean? Uh, firewood, rice, cooking oil, uh, salt, soy sauce, vinegar, and tea. So where do you find everything here? You find everything in your kitchen because you have when you have firewood, you can cook rice. When you have rice, you want some meat, then cooking oil, then flavor salt, then color soy sauce, then steeping sauce is vinegar. After you can afford everything, you can afford tea. However, that's not exactly what the life that defines a culture, because for something more cultured, we have the second sentence where you say, qin qi shu hua shi jiu cha, which means, Qin, music instrument, qi, chess, uh, shu, calligraphy, hua, paintings, uh, shi, poetry, jiu, liquor or wine, then tea. Now this is a different environment. This is a different room in your house. This is no longer your kitchen. This is your study. This is your library. This is a far more artistic life. And that's why tea was very popular, important, in Song Dynasty, because Song, as you may know, was one of the most artistic dynasty we had. Uh, they had so much money. The production was so great. All the people can just have, you know, things done nearly too easy. So they can have more time for calligraphy. They have more time for tea. They have more time for painting things or building things. So that's why till today, where we make tea now in Northern Fujian, we're still using some very old conditions and very old locations left from Song Dynasty. So that's the continuity of a culture. And you can see that here with tea, with this tea set. So that's how things go with, um, I guess, the traditional tea wear. So again, what I have here is just very, very basic tea set. Uh, usually when we have Tea formally, we have the entire table. The entire table is a is a teaware. We don't have this tray. The entire table has a different system. The water comes up, or there's a drainage that goes to the other side of the room. So uh, that's why I said that this is why I do here. I show you something quite basic with very traditional things, so that I hope one day you can maybe visit us. You know, in Dupont Circle and enjoy tea at its fullest. Right. Uh, we're getting some questions, and, and, and anyone that wants to ask a question here, just let us know. But um, uh, I guess someone wanted to see the close up of the, the wooden mold. And, sure. and, and Victoria, did I hear that your father made some yes. of these? Yeah. So um, these are the molds. So what happens is when we're making this, as I said, we're going to prepare the fillings first. Once you prepare the filling, you also have to make the dough. And the key to the dough is really your, um, what we call our citrus syrup. And that's what's binding everything. That is what is how it can have a nice tan color to it. And think of it when you're making a dumpling, a giant dumpling. So I'm not gonna bang it here. So what it is, you're making basically a dumpling almost size, and you wanna get it to the right size in order to fit these molds. Then you're gonna put them in there. I think there may be a video online that we can definitely share. 
And then once you have it put in there, you want to push it in so that way you can get all of those beautiful intricate patterns on there. And then what you have to do, I'm more civil when I knock. And so, but my sister, she can bang it out real quick. And so what you do is you just bang it and you get to bang it at a right angle and then out will come. And if you don't, you'll lose a tail, you'll lose a head, and you don't want to do that. You want to make it beautiful. Can you and perform so, surgery on a fish that's lost its tail? No, no, you'll see it. You'll see it. You'll try, but it just goes back. And then we also have the round ones too. So you can see it's time consuming and it takes patience because you have all these crevices that you need to make sure all of those round portions are completely filled. And there's beautiful patterns. So some can be flowers, definitely lotus. There's some that um, will have fish. So there's many different molds that we can do through here. So that's what it is. You know, so, someone asked uh, about the different uh, strains of tea that are out there. Uh, you know how around the world, there are a lot of like vegetables that, heirloom vegetables that have disappeared are there any teas that have gone extinct, so to speak? You know, like they, you can never get back to, to what there used uh, to be? Not really. In fact, the varieties are growing. Uh, but there are, um, there are tea drinking methods or the way we drink tea that are, that are gone. Uh, the development of tea is tightly associated with transportation. Uh, if you think about how tea started, tea first started as just boiling fresh, like fresh leaves in water. Then you take it as a soup, like you cook mm -hmm. it as a soup. That's because, well, you don't have anything to process it with and you have to enjoy tea on site. Then later on, uh, something like tea powder, for example, matcha tea states started uh, in China as a way to process tea and store them and transport them to where the consumers are because where we make tea is usually quite further away from where the major population uh, was back in, the, back in that uh, time. So for example, Song Dynasty, they compress tea into this tea break is just to transport leaves, that's easier. Uh, one pound of loose leaf tea, because we use loose leaf tea now, is about this much. And one pound of tea break is about this much. So, Imagine a thousand years ago, you have to transport tea for, for a week. The more cakes you can put on a horse or a wagon, the more money you make. So that's why tea got compressed back in days. Uh, that goes, the, this is the same reason why poor tea today, they're still in this tea break shape because their, their major customer base were actually in Tibet. So they actually need to use horses to transport all the tea leaves from Yunnan province, which is a slightly lower ground to Tibet, that's uh, very high. So you want to compress tea into these tea breaks for efficiency. Uh, so about tea varieties, we're actually creating more uh, tea varieties these days. The teas you are enjoying now is called golden peony. It's actually a hybrid uh, tea plants the single varieties, uh, for example, Tia Guanyin and the Honda, those natural ones or the ones have been there, they have some, some of them have some problems. For example, Tia Guanyin is a tea plant that has very high yield. It gives a lot of leaves, but the plant itself is quite weak. So it attracts a lot of bugs, a lot of insects. Mm -hmm. Honda, on the other hand, is a very strong plant, but it doesn't give a lot of leaves. So we sort of marriage them, right? Create a hybrid crossbreed. So they, these two plants, they deliver four different new plants with consistent and stable characteristics. Uh, for example, Huang Guanyin, Golden Peony. Uh, so that's how we create a new tea plant. So the result is we end up with a tea plant that gives very high yield and yet very strong against insects or against bugs. Um, that's why we're growing our you know, number of tea plants. And even the natural ones, for example, uh, Wulong tea. In Wuyi Mountains, we have over 200 different varieties. So the commercial ones, the commercially used ones, I would say no more than 20, 30 kinds of them. 
that, that are successful. So a very small portion of a huge library uh, that we're using right now. All right, someone from Singapore said that, uh, or they were in Singapore and they tried a durian mooncake. <laughs> have you come across that? I have not. Um, durian is a very special fragrance, so you have to know how to use it. But it's, you either love it or you don't. Exactly. And Singaporean mooncakes are gorgeous. And uh, another follow-up question. How long do mooncakes last? I think just a few hours, right? Because they disappear, right? <laughs> you know what? Um, sugar is a preservative. So the more sugar you have, the longer you can keep it. Um, for us, we are not needing to have these held for months and months. So you can keep, we always recommend you can keep it out for about like 10 days. That's fine. After that, then put it into the refrigerator. And these have just enough sugar to enjoy, to pair off with tea. And I can tell you this, um, he gave me some tea earlier. This is the um, this golden peony. I'm resisting not to drink it while I'm doing presentation, but the aroma is excellent. Yeah, you can smell it. I can yeah. smell it, so it, it's wonderful. Uh, it smells better when it's hot. I think a lot of tea now is too cold to drink, yeah. yeah so. but that's why you have me here. Someone <laughs> asked a question and they referred to it as moon pies, so they must be from you know the country. But uh, I, I do think they mean moon cakes. But, uh, but there's a, there's something else called moon pie. Is a different, um, more of a New England style. But you know what? It's the most important thing. That before I forget, the most important thing you have to do this evening, you got to go out and gaze at the moon. I mean, if you've looked at the moon the last couple of days, it was already gorgeous enough. And this evening, whatever you do, make sure you go out there and look at the moon. Have some moon cake. Have a cup of tea. Yes. Um, so how, if you didn't say this earlier, how many flavors of moon, of moon cakes do you offer typically? We typically offer about 10 different varieties and we can take custom requests those, um, but usually during the mid autumn festival, we're doing so much volume, we stay within those, um, menu items. But yes, anytime when you want a custom order, we just need to know it in advance. Because that's the nice thing when you make them on demand. Uh, does anyone in the uh, in the room have questions? Yeah. What What are some of the activities for children uh, during uh, the Mid Autumn Festival that traditionally children do? The beautiful lanterns above. Me. I mean, that's it. You know, getting dressed up and holding these lanterns, putting some batteries in there, and just having you know children being children running around. And while the adults are sitting there relaxing, children being jovial, you're having tea, you're having dessert, you're having a great family meal. So that's what I remember. And pomelos. Um, pomelos is also very, because um, again, it's a play on word. It's, um, it's a good to have during the, during the Mid-Autumn Festival. And they look like giant fruits. And I remember my mother cutting it with precision making them uh, with precision and taking that pomelo out. And as children, you get to wear them as your crown. Wow. So that was another thing I remember um, in childhood. Uh, there was another question in the back. Uh, I'm eating these lovely cakes and I realized that uh, there are different flavors. In yes, for the sample ones for um, those here today, we did multiple flavors. So we have some red bean, I believe you have red bean, lotus, a green tea, and then you had one more, actually, ginger. ginger. Okay. It's delicious. So then that way you had a little sampling of what it tastes like. I and didn't realize that it was that couple of Sometimes you, you can shock yourself and all of a sudden you've eaten half the moon cake. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, that's not normal? I know. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask a tea question. How does one know how to purchase tea? Is there a rating system or for someone who is not as educated as you on tea, I just go to the store and all I can look at is the packaging. Is there another way to, uh, to determine? This might sound I'm self-promoting, but uh, <laughs> I, I have a tea blog. Uh, Till today, I have 172 blogs, uh, just about tea. Uh, I wrote all of them. Uh, some of them can be quite detailed, including how teas are processed, uh, the transition of tea drinking, 
how we manage the tea field uh, the environment and the small climate. So basically, everything that people ask me sort of end up being a blog. Uh, it's on my website, uh, valleybrooktea.com. I think that's a good reference. Uh, then uh, there are some indications of the tea leaves when you, when you go out and buy them. For example, um, most uh, tea houses here or tea stores here, they end up storing tea in a very giant metal container. So it's like on the counter or on the shelf. Sometimes you have over 100 or 200 kinds of tea there. One thing to know is that tea leaves oxidize. If they are not tightly packaged, uh, they're usually gone within a couple months. Uh, for green tea, even they are carefully packaged, they are gone after three, three months. So if you have a two-year-old green tea, it's too old to drink. Then another way is for oolong tea, uh, if you like to check the leaves, uh, woolen tea leaves are bigger. If they are not made right or transported carefully, they are all broken into different pieces. So you want to check the integrity of tea leaves. Uh, this is a, essentially why uh, we usually present woolen tea on this bamboo piece. That's the purpose to let you see the integrity or how uh, intact those leaves are. So I think there are a couple of tells you can, you can check. And if they let you smell the leaf before you buy the leaf, that tea is gone. Because it's oxidized already. You have to smell it from a container or something. So, uh, but that only works with uh, the real teas, like the traditional teas. If you are buying some herbal drinks, uh, pumpkin something, peach something, uh, I I do not have any suggestion because I'm not really familiar with those things. Yeah. I think what surprises me in your demonstrations is how how quickly you steep the tea. Right. And I realize, man, I've ste I'm steeping it for minutes and minutes, so, maybe 15 minutes. Um, so your tea you're drinking is actually made from this. This is how fast it goes. We just pour through tea leaves in this funnel and we uh, get tea. So. Uh, we do this with black tea and oolong tea because they are more processed. For good quality, black tea and oolong tea, uh, they should be instant. Like once hot water gets in contact with leaves, you produce aroma, color, taste, like right there. Uh, no steeping time is needed. For black tea and oolong tea, uh, the guidance is really just if you cannot hold your breath underwater for that long, tea leaves usually cannot hold your breath underwater for that long. And okay. green tea, however, is different. Green tea needs to be steeped because green tea is not processed enough. Mm -hmm. So green tea is, well, green. Uh, that's, so there's slightly different, slight difference. And then another thing is water temperature. Uh, for most teas except green tea, you should just use boiling water temperature. I know there are a lot of tea packages, tea products tell you exactly what temperature to use. Uh, if you are buying high quality teas, just ignore that. They all should go with uh, 212 Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, boiling temperature water. Tea leaves can take it. Well, I think we're just about out of time. We're a little over. So thank you to Victoria Wu from Cakes by Happy Eatery and uh, Yunhan Zhang from uh, Valley Brook Tea. And also thank you to Louisa Sorkness, it's one of our one of our camera uh, women. She's she's the uh, she's the, the 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 force behind putting these events together. So uh, thank you to everyone for joining us here in person. It's so nice to see people here in the museum and then uh, also online. So uh, have a have a happy mid autumn moon festival, and uh, we will hope to see everybody soon. Thank you very much. Uh, we will end our um, we will end our uh, session with a screen for people online who can get the website. But uh, as we mentioned earlier, we will email these websites. Thank you. Thank you. Very very smooth. Very good.